Good morning. Oh, I thought you folks were ready for that. Everybody was almost in their seat. That's great. Good morning. Oh, that's, that's almost a little better. Um, <laughs> all right. Well, we've got, uh, got to welcome you to Oakland Church of Nazarene this morning. It's good to see you here. And uh, a few announcements to, to get the service started this morning. Um, one that's near and dear to my heart is the garage sale coming up. Actually, kind of in a way, starting today. So after, uh, if you have things that you want to donate and drop off, those, uh, those great gently used items that are clean and not torn or ripped or bruised or battered, um, you can drop them off over here after, um, after journey groups are over and maybe before the teen fundraiser dinner, uh, I'll have someone stationed over here, this, this northwest corner uh, door, and then we're just going to line everything up against that wall there. Um, if you would like to volunteer still, there is plenty of spaces still open. So I'll be out there in the link. Try not to avoid me. Just try. <laughs> Um, and, and if you can unpack a bag or a box and, and maybe take it to tables where it goes, you can help with setup. If you can smile and take money, most of us smile when we take money. You can do that Thursday, Friday, or Saturday during the sale. And, and while you're not taking money, we might have you come out and, and uh, organize some things on tables. Uh, and be kind to people. If you can be kind to people, I know you guys can be kind to people. So you can do that Thursday, Friday, or Saturday during the setup. If you like to tear things down, which I hope nobody likes to do that, but if you like to tear things down, you can help us at 2.30 on Saturday. Get this all back into a shape where we can worship on Sunday. So we need your help. Um, I'm sure that everybody's waited to the last minute to sign up, so I'm just having faith that that's the case. But it's all for a great cause, Hope CDA. And my goal this year is to make 4000 bucks. Okay? Nobody went, ooh. So let's just raise it to 5000 Why not? Okay? All right. So garage sale right after um, service today. I mean, not the service, but the journey groups and classes. After that, we're going to have a teen fundraiser. It's going to be a walking taco um, dinner. So please, please stick around for that. There's going to be envelopes that you can take and put the appropriate amount of money in that envelope that it has written on it, and that will help the, the teens do the things that they want to do for this upcoming year. Uh, great cause, and uh, in, in relation to that, the, Do, the Dolash group usually meets over here, okay? And if you're in that group, you know that for a fact. So today, you're not going to be meeting there because they're setting up for the fundraiser dinner. So you folks are going to meet up in the teen room. You're just going to kind of switch places today, okay? I can't, you can't go back in time and feel like a teenager, but you can meet up in the teen room, okay? And uh, that's where your, your uh, class group is going to, to meet today. And we also have four ways to give. There's more ways than four. I hope you know that, okay? But these are the four main ways. And uh, the fifth way is coming today through the garage sale and through the teen fundraiser. So there's another way to give. But give generously because God loves a cheerful giver. All right, at this time, we are going to have the worship team come out. They're a little shy today. And we have some teens joining us too, so... We'll wait till they we'll wait till they get out here. Oh, I'm sorry. So we're just all going to go out there except for Christian and Tori. Thank you. I, uh, I'm like, oh, maybe I misread or heard something, but uh, you're good. Well, guys, um, I'm Tori, and this is Christian. He is on our teen council and um, he's going to share just a couple stories of what it's like being 
a teen in the Oakland Teen Youth Group, but also what has happened through the various events. Over the years, you've been to camp, you've been to fall retreat, you've been around. And so I thought, we thought, it would be better to hear from someone who's lived it than someone who just kind of leads it. So take it away, Christian. Yeah, so like, like he said, I'm Christian. I'm sure most of you guys have probably <laughs> seen me around. I'm here way, way too much, it feels like sometimes. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, teen, teen groups has been like kind of the, I guess, anchor of sorts for the past few years because I think we can all agree that it's been pretty hectic since <laughs> around like really, like obviously COVID was uh, a lot to have to deal with, but I'd say even before then, it, life's just been pretty crazy. And uh, ever since seventh grade, teens have been kind of like the, you know, you get, to, you get to show up every Wednesday and Sunday. There's going to be somebody there who does care about you and other people who you can be friends with and also care about you, which is in itself super huge. But not only that, but, like, when we get to go on these trips, like uh, go to Camp Table Rock or go to Fall Retreat, like Tori was saying, we, we get to see and experience the church not just here in Oakland, not even just in Cedar Rapids, but also we get to see it like throughout the whole state of Iowa and even farther. Like, I mean, I, I know that one thing that the church definitely needs more of nowadays is uh, the feeling of like connected sense of unity between everybody. And I know that Acts chapter two says all the believers were in one accord, which that's a quizzing joke, but <laughs> beside that, um, yeah, uh, we, we usually like, that's what we need. I think that's what we need to see more of is uh, the ability to like feel the body of Christ everywhere else that we are able to go to, not just here at Oakland. And so, I mean, well, obviously we can, God, God is, God is everywhere. Like that's kind of his big thing, isn't it? But um, like I, being able to go to stuff like the fall retreat or camp or who knows what else that um, makes it able to see other people who are living out God in their lives. And it makes a bit, it's made a big impact on me. You can ask any of the other older teens and they'll tell you how much it's impacted them, even, even the younger ones. So yeah, I guess what I'm trying to say is that being able to go to those places, it's what helps lots of us be able to grow in Christ. And without, without funding from you guys and other people, we really don't have the ability to be able to do that consistently. So yeah, that, it's my piece, at least. Yeah, thank you, Christian. Could give a round of applause for our teen council and Christian. We, we have an amazing group. So brother, dude, proud of you. Love you, man. And uh, yeah, we have a good, a good leadership. Jacob uh, and Lily and Christian are, are on teen council, and they're great. Um, and yeah, so I mean, the, the next kind of part, you know, I, I kind of want to share a little bit of my heart of what the teen fundraiser is, but also more broadly, like... What is the youth group? What are the needs? And how can Oakland Church really get behind the teen department? Um, this is kind of, if you've seen, youth, Sunday, we have teens, you know, playing the drums, singing. Um, it's, I love that. I think we need to see more of our people, our, our teens on stage. It always encourages me. I hope it encourages you too. Um, and I will say that the, the, the teens, they're not the next generation. I mean, they are, but they're they're actually the current generation. They're not going to grow up into your environment. You're actually growing up into their environment. The tech, the Wi-Fi. I mean, the teens, they are the generation. And to not invest in poor energy and, and even finances, I will say, to our teens could really be a miss because part of the, the leading and the programming that, that I currently do is to help set up and bring fellowship. And Christian mentioned, you know, everybody wants to be loved and, and valued. And I think our culture is screaming all the wrong things. And our teens just want to feel loved and valued. And if that's not by Jesus, if that's not by their church, then the world's going to look a lot better. And the lies of Satan, will, will, it will steal them away. And so, um, yeah, just kind of briefly, I just want to share, you know, I, regardless of who's leading the youth group, you know, um, leadership doesn't mean necessarily impact. I think the body of Christ, the, the unity of the church is what leads to real life change. And so I want to encourage you guys to be partially prayerful. You know, we need volunteers. Every department needs volunteers. You know, that's not a new thing to the teens. But, man, church, the teens love you. And I think they need to know that you love them. You know, it's, 
I know we meet in a different room, and we do cross and intermingle, and I love seeing the intermingling on stage. Um, it makes my heart happy. I think it makes God happy, too. But be prayerful, you know, um, and not just financially, although that we are asking today to, if the Lord leads you, to pick an envelope. Um, our teens have, <laughs> some are very skilled at drawing stuff. I am not one of those teens. Uh, some are very creative and funny, and I try to be, but I don't know if I am. But I, I encourage you guys to look at the envelopes that were made. You don't necessarily have to take one, but our teens put time and effort the last two weeks to create and to craft uh, envelopes with their own personal take, um, whether it's like an Among Us meme or if it's SpongeBob SquarePants. I mean, they took time to make some of these envelopes. And if, and if you feel so led, and I'd encourage you to pray about it, man, please, please donate to the teens. Um, you know, the teens, we want to not just grow the program. We want to, to grow our influence of Jesus. And we want, we want Christ to be glorified in the youth group. Um, when I got back, like around five weeks ago, I want to read a note um, that was very dear to my heart, which really encouraged me. You know, I was injured for ugh, over a year, sad. And I was so excited to be back. And this is a letter I got from uh, sweet Brittany. And she said I could read this. And it says, Dear Tori, I have missed you so much. I love you so, so, so much. You're the best youth pastor there is. And... You saved my soul because you preached, and I'm glad you're back. I can't believe that it's been a year and a few weeks. You're everything to all of us, and I love you, Tori. I know. It, I love you too, Brittany, wherever you are. Um, you're here somewhere, but something like that, you know, life change happens when you invest in the youth group. And praise Jesus, this is not Tori so great. This is God is so good. And if we're willing to step up and love these teens, you don't have to be a preacher, you don't have to be a teacher. I mean, I mean, Christian, you, I, know, I know you've impacted the younger kids. As a children's pastor years prior, you know, I loved having, we called him Captain Cupcake. We've made him a cape. <laughs> but he would come into the, the children's area and he would dance his jig. He was my junior volunteer. And, and man, I had a kid say, Tori, when I grow up, I want to be like Christian. He's so cool. And just the, even generational leadership, I mean, we need to invest in our teens because they're going to invest in your grandkids, maybe your actual kids, maybe your great-grandkids. And that, I'm not trying to manipulate or the, the level of leadership needs to be passed on. And it doesn't start with the pastor. It starts with the church, you know? Now, obviously, I want to model, and obviously, Christian is a great leader. He's going to model that. But it takes all of us, not just a few of us. So I want to ask you guys, and and... And even challenge you guys, not necessarily, again, not to give. I'm not necessarily asking for your money, although please give. <laughs> I'm asking that if you would really pray for our youth group, pray for our teens. And, and if God would lead you, maybe and start investing, maybe volunteer. M maybe, you know, adopt a teen and take them out to lunch or write them a, a letter every other week or something to encourage them. Because, guys, the world, you guys know this, is kind of scary, especially now more than ever. And our teens are getting fed all the wrong messages. So this morning as we praise Jesus and, and praise with our teens and celebrate just the ministry overall, I pray that you would thank them too, you know. Um, it's been really hard for them the last year. They've had five different types of leaders over the last year when I was out, and, um, and they, need, they need to feel loved. And I love them so much. Uh, I just, uh, yeah. They have my heart, and, and I hope and pray that they know that you love them too. Because God, he loves them. So, yeah, I guess that's all I gotta say. But I pray we're gonna have walking tacos from noon to two after your guys' life group. So please come. We will feed you, you know, talk to some teens, share some stories, talk to me. Um, love to tell you what's going on. There are events. We have things planned out throughout the year. Um, and, I, you know, I don't, know the details on those exactly, but um, yeah, I love you guys, you know, I know you guys love the teens, you know, and I ask that you would help show that and, and invest, invest in them, because they, they are the current generation, and, uh, and God loves them, so I love you guys, make it Christian, and I appreciate you all. Good morning. Let's start out with our call to worship. Christ has died. 
Christ is coming again. Stand up and join us as we sing.
morning from Psalm 145 verses 5 through 7. I will meditate on the glorious splendor of your majesty and on your wondrous works. Men shall speak of the might of your awesome acts and I will declare your greatness. They shall utter the memory of your great goodness and shall sing of your righteousness. See you 
Congregation, you can be seated. 
I, I want to come back and sing that after prayer. I know we changed the order, but we need that song today. Amen. Uh, the seasons are changing. Do you sense that? I'm sure some of you were involved in football yesterday, somehow, some fashion. Uh, I've been in a couple banquets the last couple of evening, and I, my wife and I, I don't know when we've been to two banquets, two nights in a row, long, both Christian, both good, uh, changing seasons. The weather's changing. Uh, you notice that? I was listening on my way to Cedar Rapids last night to the broadcast of the Hawkeyes. I didn't catch the Cyclones yesterday or you and I or the Bulldogs. People say, Pastor Dave, who are you for? I'm for all of them. <laughs> I'm just an Iowa one, okay? But I was listening to the broadcast and they kept saying, yeah, we're watching the radar. We're on a 30-minute lightning pause and if there's not a strike in eight miles, I thought, eight miles, fooey. I'm concerned about the lightning strike in front of my car right now. <laughs> Things change, and we're in a changing season. And as a church, you know, we're in a changing season. Recently, we dealt with the change of our lead pastor. And I have a letter from our district superintendent I've been asked to communicate this morning. It's dated today, and it says, Dear Oakland Church Family, In my new assignment as district superintendent, I met with your church board and your church staff several times. In a meeting this last Tuesday with your youth pastor, Chai's children's director, Tori Slippy, I accepted his resignation according to the church manual, paragraph 159.5, Church of the Nazarene, 2017 to 21. This resignation is to happen concurrently with the senior pastor's resignation, and it did not happen due to the medical leave of Pastor Tory and the change of the district superintendent. Please join me in praying for the Slippies and Oakland Church in this season of change. Timothy Carter, Iowa District Superintendent. Now, this is not easy, and I know it's emotional, and your district superintendent and your church board, as well as your interim pastor, are trying to be as transparent as we can be with you. And so as you leave the service today, there's a peach-colored sheet that has five FAQs, frequently asked questions. These don't, will not answer all of your questions, but it's our attempt to be transparent with you and just so you know, Pastor Tori and I went through these the other morning together, and it's designed to help you and answer you. Say, what's next for Oakland Church? Well, we're in a church of transition, and that's not easy. Uh, Pastor Tori and Emily and I prayed this morning before we left the office complex to come here to do ministry. We're going to pray for them today, and we're going to pray for the church today. And the message this morning from the Word is applicable to not only this change, but the broader scope of who we're going to des desire this church to become in the tomorrows of God. The, I shared this with Pastor Tori and Emily today, and I think it might be wise for all of us to pray over this. We get attached to leadership, but leadership comes and goes. It's true in politics. It's true in education. If you were listening to football anywhere yesterday, it happens in athletics. And I need to tell you today, leadership changes in the church. But, lead, but the church's strength does not depend on who's the paid staff. The church's authority is in Jesus Christ. And all of us need to realize, and we need to commit this to prayer today. We get attached to people. You say, oh, we don't want to see pastor so-and-so leave. That's understandable. I've been in the seat where you are. You have to open your heart and allow God to grow it as new leadership comes along. But those of us in ministry, your past pastor, Pastor Tori and Emily today, people like me, when these changes take place, we don't just have to meet one or two new couples or new people. 
we have to grow our heart too because we go to another assignment and we have to love and embrace the whole group. And so God needs all of us today to be open to growing our heart and allowing the spirit to guide him. We're going to ask in a few moments, we're going to ask them to come forward and some of you want to gather around them and pray, but some of you brought some things to this service. Some of our families are grieving and we certainly need to pray for our culture. This week, there'll be several hundred people in this room that don't know Jesus Christ. Are we going to step up and be Jesus and talk to Jesus? You see, church, we have an awful lot to pray about. And I shared with you a couple weeks ago, Philippians 4, 6, and 7. And Paul said, and it came to me, I've been trying to lean into that scripture far beyond Oakland Church. But it says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, let your request be made known unto God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. And we all have a choice today. It's emotional, it's difficult, but are you going to allow anxiety to rule or the peace of Jesus Christ in your heart and mind? And it's not just with the staff change. It's about everything in our life. If you have a need this morning, while Cheryl plays softly, I want you to come. You can kneel, you can sit in the front row. Maybe you just want to stand. Pastor Tori and Emily are going to come, and some of you want to just surround them. But I'm asking you to pray for me today. My 15-year-old grandson needs a touch of God physically today. And sometimes in these interims, I feel like, and this is a day I can say this honestly, I want to pray the prayer of Solomon. Oh God, touch me and give me wisdom how to govern this great people of yours. And I don't know what's on your heart today, but we need to pray about that and lay it down and give it to God. Amen. And so you just bow your head. If you want to stay seated, you can, but some of you want to come forward and pray about something I've mentioned this morning or something else. And uh, I purposely, I didn't plan to do this, but while we were singing about the goodness of God, when we get done with prayer, I want the worship team to lead us again because we need those lyrics today and we need to understand the goodness of God and his plan for you and I and all that's happening in our lives these days. Would you bow and let's look to God in prayer together. Now, Father, here we are today on a Sunday morning. We're humbled in your presence because change is not easy for us. And it's not about personalities. It's about the kingdom. It's about you. And we recognize that you have been good to us today. And we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your faithfulness. You've never left us or forsaken us or left us alone. As Paul said, the Lord stood by me and we believe you're going to stand by us today. Every family, every teenager, every person on the church board, every person in the pews, even the people who aren't Christian that live and work and play as our neighbors and work associates, you, you don't forsake any of us. You and you alone are God. And I praise you today for your goodness. Thank you today that you invite us to the altar of full surrender to where we can say, Jesus, we need wisdom. We need strength. We need the touch of God. We need a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit in our own heart. We don't understand everything that happens in life, but we confess that you have all the answers because you're God. And we surrender what we don't understand today. And we ask that you'd open our heart. Search me, O oh God, and know my heart. 
and see if there's anything in my heart that's offensive to you and lead me in the way everlasting. We pray you touch our church board today. We pray that you would touch our journey group leaders and every person who's part of the umbrella under the umbrella of Oakland Church of the Nazarene. Give us grace and wisdom and strength of these days. And Lord, help us with all the voices that clamor for our attention to keep our eyes focused upon you, Jesus Christ, the Lord of the church. We believe that your grace is sufficient. And we say, as Paul said, I know whom I have believed, and I am persuaded that God is able to keep that which I've committed unto him until the day that Jesus comes again. Would you bless us today with a sense of your presence? Honor the preaching of the word and the fellowship of the brethren and the time we spend with teen ministry today. Bring your anointing and help us today to sense God in the middle of it all. And we'll praise you and thank you in Jesus' precious name we pray. And all God's people said, amen and amen. Let's sing about the goodness of God. Worship team, would you lead us? And faithful and all my life you have been so so good every breath that I am able oh I will sing of the goodness of God one more time cause all I think I mentioned this to you several weeks ago. I don't want to embarrass Pastor Bob, but he and I happen to be about the same age. And we traveled in a group in college that sang. I'd like to be up here with these young people this morning singing, but I don't need a microphone to sing. You don't want that to happen. Pastor Bob sang, and I was in the group. I just wanted to preach, but it's good to have our young people participating this morning in the service. And I want to give you a statement I read a few weeks ago as we began because I, I really believe it's important that you hear the voice of the Holy Spirit through the Word, not just Pastor Dave this morning, but this statement will challenge you. It challenges me. I've been trying to lean into it for a year. And that is this, the, the goal of, of spiritual stamina is that when a problem arises... I will react out of wisdom rather than emotion. And I really would exhort you in this moment with all the emotion, I know this is an emotional day, with all the emotion, would you, would you allow your heart just to soak up the word in the next few moments? We can't act like there's no emotion but we can't be ruled by it either. And I, I would challenge you in these moments, would you, would you allow the Holy Spirit to help your emotion right now, whatever it is, to be secondary to your open heart as to what God wants to say in the next few moments. This message, I, I have to tell you, I preach about everywhere I go if I'm there very long. It's a message about allowing your life to be giving living with your spiritual gifts. I preached last week, mentioned the acronym SHAPE, 
And in my weeks and months, however long that duration is, I plan to train your church board and your leaders to understand S-H-A-P-E. Some of them do. The concept's new to some of them. Uh, what I'm preaching today, some of you say, well, Pastor, I've known that for 50 years. But there's a lot of people that will have never seen what I'm going to tell you in the next 20 to 30 minutes. And I believe it really is because I care about your spiritual development. And you say, what's the goal of the church? I always have people say, well, the goal of the church is to get people saved. But that's not the end of the line. The goal of the church is to make spirit-filled, reproductive disciples of Jesus Christ. And coming to Christ in salvation is just one of the very first steps in that lifelong process. And on the journey to spiritual maturity, we have to reckon with this issue of spiritual gifts. It's a big subject. It really deserves five messages, but it's only going to get one in the here and now. The scriptures in Romans 12. If you have your Bible, your tablet, your phone, take a moment and go there with me, would you? Romans chapter 12, verses 6, 7, and 8. Romans chapter 12 is a great, great chapter in Paul's teaching. And he says to them, and I'm reading the NIV, Romans 12, 6 through 8, we have different gifts according to the grace given us. If a man's gift is prophesying, let him use it in proportion to his faith. If it is serving, let him serve. If it is teaching, let him teach. If it is encouraging, let him encourage. If it is contributing to the needs of others, let him give generously. If it is leadership, let him govern diligently. If it is showing mercy, let him do it cheerfully. I want to preach to you this morning about giving living with my spiritual gifts. Lord, would you help us? Teach us in the statutes and the truths of God and help us to be a redeemed people who are called out of darkness into your marvelous light and allow the Holy Spirit to make a difference through our life to edify the body of Christ and build the kingdom. Give us a heart that is giving living with our spiritual gifts, we pray. Amen. My spiritual gifts are related to Christ and the church. And the benefits of giving them are I'm participating in building the kingdom of God. Now, I just have to tell you, as a pastor, and some of you can identify with this, not just men, but ladies as well, you're part of a group or a club. I've been to the, to the Kiwanis. I've been a Rotary member. I've been part of different groups and clubs, civic and private. And it's great to be part of groups that are good groups, but have good people for good causes. But there is no group in the world that surpasses the church of Jesus Christ. When you are a Christian, you're part of the greatest work in all the world. And we Christians have different stripes and polka dots. There are Catholics and Baptists and Pentecostals and Methodists and Lutherans and Nazarenes. Do you know that today in America there are more people who go to non-denominational churches than there are that go to ones with a tag or a label? It's true. But it doesn't change the fact that if you're a Christian, you're part of the greatest, biggest, grandest, most eternal work in the world. You're part of the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And today, we're going to look at the subject of spiritual gifts. Not all of you will agree with what I say. That's okay. But I'm attempting to unpack or unfold this delicate and controversial subject 
in a manner that you could take some simple things away today from worship and it'll make a forever difference in your giving living for Jesus Christ. Uh, chapter 12 is powerful. He talks, Paul does, about spiritual worship, the renewal of our mind, finding one's place and properly using these things called spiritual gifts. And there's a bunch of them in the New Testament. I'm not negating the broader gifts. But today, I want to focus on the seven that are listed in these three verses. One author said, and I subscribe to this, many, I did many years ago, and I believe it today. These basic gifts are necessary in every church. I heard again this week from Christian historian David Barton, who happened to be in Cedar Rapids for a luncheon this week, there are 350,000 plus churches in America. The great majority of them are under 85 in attendance. 85% of all the churches in America are plateaued or declining. 15% are growing, and out of the 15%, 14%, the growth is all sheep jump, jumping from pen to pen, or people going from this church to that church and coming from that church to this church. Only 1% have convert growth. And you know, for those of us who are pastors, this is a challenge, but it's also a challenge for you as a person in the pew, I mean the chair. Do we want to be a church that's static and decline? Do we want to be a church that just looks at the numbers because we gained 30 from here and sent 20 there and so we show a plus 10? Or do we want to be a healthy church that's sharing Christ through our lifestyle where people are attracted and whether they pray behind the steering wheel of their car or at their kitchen sink or in front of their computer in their easy chair or in an altar of the church, they come to Christ and they join the family of God because while they once were blind, now they see they had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. That's the kind of church I want to be a part of. And this subject of spiritual gifts plays largely into the characteristics of what kind of church we're going to be. So let's, let's unpack this for a few moments. I don't want to reread the scripture, but you see in your notes there, there's the gift of prophesying, and it says use it in proportion to your faith. Several years ago, I had a staff member who left my staff. I, he was a pastor. He came to be an associate of mine, and he resigned. And when he gave me his resignation, he said, Pastor Dave, I love you. I love this church. But I got to preach. And in my role, I don't get to do much of that here. And I have to move on because I, I, God's called me to preach, and that's a gift. And he and I are good friends many years later. But for him, this spiritual gift was way at the top of the stack. And he knew for him to be faithful to the call of God in his life, not just a minister or pastor, but to use his spiritual gift, he had to get in a place where he could maximize that to its full capacity. That's a good thing. And it says serving. Every church needs people who will do that, and I'm doing it this morning. Every church needs people who will serve. They just love to help others and be a blessing. Every church needs correct, convictional, Bible-based teachers who are gifted in dissecting the word and taking it and breaking it up and passing it on in classes and groups. Every church needs that. If you don't have that, you'll become like the church in Revelation 2 and 3 that's doctrinally corrupt because... People will believe every wind and wave of doctrine. We need people who have the gift of teaching. Encouraging, this is a big one. If 
you say, well, I don't have much money to give or I don't want to be up front. I don't want to be with a large group of people. You, you may have the gift of encouragement and you don't have to call a committee meeting to encourage somebody, amen? You could do it one person at a time. And it has no clock, it has no boundary, it's not a program, but some people are just gifted with the, group, the gift of encouragement. Then there's contributing to the needs of others. And this isn't talking about one of the four ways Kirk mentioned we give to the church. We, we, give, we return to God our, the tithe of the Lord and we give our offerings. And I trust you'll give some offering today. Whether you stay for lunch, and I hope you can and do and will. I'm going to, but whether you stay for lunch or not, you need to pick up one of these envelopes because the church board gives the youth department a little bit of a budget, but it doesn't cover all the things that are on the calendar. And aside from who the youth leader is, you need to, to give. If God's given you some resources, you need to pick up one of these envelopes and you need to give to the teen ministry today. But this, this passage... It's not about the weekly giving. It alludes to the fact that there are people, and I'm preaching to some of them today, in the house or watching online, there are people that are listening to me preach this message that at this time, at this place in your life, God's given you abundance of resources and more than anything else, God may tap you on the shoulder or give you a pitter-patter in your heart and say, you need to give some money away to this cause, this mission, this person, this issue. God uses that, and every church needs that, including this one. Somebody ought to say amen. And then there's leadership. I'm involved in leadership. I'm not the only leader. But it says, and every church needs leadership. Amen. They need people who are called and passionate and gifted and willing to be in leadership. You say, what's that mean? Well, I, I'm not bragging or complaining. It just happens to be my lot. I think this is church number 23. I've done an interim in. And I hear this in every church, and they weren't all Nazarene, so it's not a Nazarene statement that I'm about to make. I hear people say, well, I sure don't, a church, I don't agree with the church leadership. Well, then you live such a life that you get nominated and say yes, and you come to all the meetings and wrestle with what we wrestle with. Amen? Amen. It's much easier to criticize the leadership when you aren't in the saddle riding the horse. And you need your pastor, your staff, your church board, you need to pray for them because every church needs this elementary basic gift of leadership to be exhibited. And you have good leaders, but they need your prayers in these days as we search for a pastor for the next generation of this church. And number seven, showing mercy. And if you are a merciful person by nature, we thank God for you. But you need to do it because there are some of the rest of us, we aren't near as merciful and everybody, everybody, everybody in the church needs to be the recipient of a merciful person on a regular basis. Amen? Do I do it all right? No. Do you do it all right? No. Do we always have the right attitude? No. But we need people in every church, this one included, who have the gift of showing mercy, not just attitudinally, but helping people when they can't help themselves and loving people when they really don't deserve it or they don't treat you good in spite of how you show them mercy. Every church needs the gift of showing mercy. Now, I don't have time to talk about all the broader gifts, but I've listed them there for you. And I've combed over a lot of material across the years and across denominational lines and theological walls. And this is a list of the broad gifts. 1 Corinthians 12 lists some of those. Ephesians 4 lists, lists some of those. 
There are other scriptures who mention that other group, celibacy, volunteer poverty, martyrdom, hospitality, missionary, da-da-da. I'm not negating any of those gifts today, but they're broader, and you don't need all of those in one church to make it go. God, the Holy Spirit, gives those gifts, and periodically through different people, they need to be exercised in the local church. But the top seven, you got to have them in every church. And we'll talk with your leadership about that later, and you'll probably hear about it. But I want to talk briefly here about spiritual gifts are given by the Holy Spirit, and you get them from the time of your spiritual birth, when you get saved or born again or converted or you place your trust in Jesus Christ, at that moment the Holy Spirit endows you with at least one spiritual gift. And they're God-given and they are given to members of God's family. They're not natural talents and People say, well, this is the same as the fruit of the Spirit. No, 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 no. The gifts of the Spirit are different than the fruit of the Spirit. There's a distinctive difference. And the fruit of the Spirit's in Galatians 5, 22, 23. That's a whole other subject. And the spiritual gifts are not Christian roles. People say, well, he has the gift of faith. Well, we all have some measure of faith, but it's not necessarily, well, she has the gift of intercession. Well, she may have, but the truth is all of us have the role of prayer. So the the gifts are not necessarily Christian roles, and they're given to every believer. I mentioned when they become a Christian with the gifts that God chooses for him or her, And no one Christian has all the gifts, nor is any one gift common to all Christians. And the scripture's there. What's the purpose? To glorify God, to build the unity, the maturity, and the growth of the body of Christ, the the good of the whole, the church at large. If you don't participate, the church will miss the benefit of what God's put you here for. Wow. Wow powerful truth and finding and discovering your gift this is an old list but it's so contemporary explore your possibilities experiment with as many gifts as possible examine your feelings evaluate your effectiveness expect confirmation I remember going to Dodge City Kansas first church of the Nazarene I mentioned this previously When I dated my wife, I went there one Sunday morning, the pastor who is a very godly man and was a great pastor, he said, yeah, we've heard about you, son. You're a preacher boy, and you're preaching this morning. I said, Brother P, his last name started with a P. I said, I'm bringing my girlfriend home to see her parents. He said, I want you to preach. I said, I don't have any notes. He said, Sunday school's first. You got an hour, son. The study's down the hall. (laughs) An hour, 20 minutes, I was sitting on the platform and I preached. 19 years old. There was an old saint in the church. Thank God for the old saints. I didn't know her. I never met her before. If I mentioned... Her name, you probably wouldn't know her, but everybody in Kansas on the western half did. She's from a large, large Nazarene family. She hobbled up the aisle afterwards and grabbed my arm and said, Son, God wants you to preach. I've been, it's confirmed in my heart that God's laid a burden on you to preach the gospel. If you use your spiritual gift consistently, the body of Christ will confirm what God's put in your life and heart, and it will edify the whole church. Wow. Be a Christian. Believe in spiritual gifts. Be willing to work and be prayerful. Well, that's, that's all the sermon. But I got a couple stories. One is 
I think the first Sunday I was here, or the second, I don't remember now. It's been a fast two and a half months. My, my mother was in the hospital. She had a heart attack. And a few weeks ago, a lady called me from Wichita, Kansas. I did an interim there three plus years ago. The last Sunday was the day the COVID curtain fell. It was that March something of a couple years ago. She called me. She said, Pastor Dave, I'm going to be in Des Moines on August. And she gave me the date. And I want to meet with you. Now, her name's Joan. And Joan and I worked together on a project in that local church that ran about 80 in the interim. And she, she's in her 80s. And she uh, said, I want to meet with you. Can you meet with me for a half hour that day? I said, well, Joan, here's the problem. My mom had a heart attack. And She's back in that day for a stent procedure. And I, I don't know what time you're coming. I don't know how long you're going to be here. But I, I got to be at the hospital with my mom and my sister that day. So give me your phone number and I'll call. And would you believe at 510, I'm walking out of the hospital that day. I have a message from Joan. Pastor Dave, I'm here. I'm at the Hilton Inn and such and such. And Can you meet with me? I called her up. And I said, Joan. If I come right now, it's going to take me 20 minutes. Do you have a half hour? And I leave because i got to go back home with my mom and spend the night. She said, I'll be there. So I drove 20 minutes and walked into the hotel. And she's a little short, stout lady. And she gave me a big hug. And I gave her a big hug. And we sat down in the sofa and in the waiting room there in the lobby. And I said, what's happening, Joan? She said, just wanted to see you and encourage you. I had the same reaction as you. I said, really? You want to see me? And she goes, tell me about your mom. I said, well, my mom's 80, whatever. And she said, and, and she had a heart attack, and she got a stent today. And She goes, well, I can't show you, Pastor Dave, but I'm a year younger than your mom. I'm wearing a heart monitor right now. I've had a heart attack. I've had procedures like your mom. I can identify with where you are on the journey. Woo! Now I want to tell you, in a hundred years, you can't plan those things. But when you sign up in the kingdom and say to God, God, apparently you've given this to me and I'm going to surrender it and you use it at will. I'm telling you, God will do it and you'll never know this side of heaven how much difference it'll make in the life of a person. I was with her for 22 minutes. She, had, she was on a bus tour from, Can from Wichita, Kansas to Michigan for a week and I held her hand and I prayed for her, and she prayed for me, and I said, give your pastor, who's a friend of mine, give him my regards, and tell the church board we love him, and we're praying for him. I prayed for her, and she prayed for me, and we got up and gave a hug, and there's another couple from the Nazarene church there. We shook their hand, walked out the door, and I'm going, wow, I'm sure glad she used the gift of encouragement in her life today. Now the other is a little more ancient. And while I'm not a historian, I'm fascinated by history. If you don't pay attention to it, we'll repeat the errors of it, and that's a dangerous thing. World War II. Most of us in this room, some of us can, but most of us don't remember it. Is that fair? I'm trying to be kind. The first scrap between the Third Reich under Adolf Hitler and the Americans, the Germans whooped up on us. It wasn't a good battle. And we would have been in for deep trouble, except somehow in the providence of God, they had put this guy in charge named George Patton. Now he... He wasn't a Gestapo, but he wasn't milky toast either. He had some backbone, and he said to the American soldiers, I don't care where we are, you're going to shine your shoes. 
And when an officer of the service comes by, you're going to salute and you're going to go to bed and get up this time and we're going to have discipline. We're not just here to pass time or draw money. We are here not just to engage in the fight, but we're in the fight to win. And you just have to take my word if you don't want to read the history. Under his leadership, the American attitude in the armed forces changed. And we didn't get whooped all the rest of the war. Why? Because a man was willing to say, I'll surrender who I am and I'll invest it in the group. And God blessed it. And the rest is history. Then you can go, let's just rewind a little farther. World War II. Let's go back to the Civil War. Abraham Lincoln. He had a dysfunctional father who didn't care about him and threw his books as a young boy in the fire. His mother died. She was saved at a camp meeting, and she prom made young Abe at nine years of age promise he'd read the Bible, and he had hardship after hardship after hardship, and he lost election after election after election. And God, if you feel like your heart, your life is hard, God used all that hardship, a lifetime of it, 50-plus years in Abraham Lincoln's life, he used the hardship to prepare him for a season at the end. And Abraham Lincoln said, we've got to save the union. We need to preserve the republic that God's given us. We need some people in our day in the church to embrace that mission. Beyond being part of the kingdom of Jesus Christ, second of all, you need to be willing to fight for the liberties we prize. And I'm telling you what's coming down the pike there's a bill on the California legislative floor that's asking that the government and the schools or the government could take your children away and put them in a foster home if you don't agree with the transgender issue. They're talking about taking the nonprofit status away from churches. And when they do that, they'll come after those of us who have the pastor label. And if we don't tow tow to the agenda, we'll not be allowed to preach. And the next thing is, if you don't agree with the public government agenda, they'll invade your home and they'll take your weapon and they'll determine what you say in the public arena. That's all coming down the pike. And Lincoln said in the Civil War, we got to fight for that. And we need to fight for it today. If you're not registered to vote, you need to go register to vote this month and vote 50-some days from now in this midterm election. You say, Pastor, you're going to tell us who to vote for? No, you need, if you're a God-fearing, Bible-believing Christian, you need to vote for the person who has biblical values. But I'm detouring. Lincoln said, we need soldiers. If you haven't been to the Iowa State Capitol, you need to go. Because around the rotunda at the top, started in 1874, our capital is dedicated to the abolitionists from Iowa who fought the Civil War in the early 1860s. You see, in those days, the big church in Iowa was the Methodist Episcopal Church. At one time, the, the Methodist Church had a thousand congregations in the state of Iowa. They're down to about 750 now. But in those days, those God-fearing people called Methodists were committed to the spiritual and civil liberties that we inherited as a country. And per capita, the state of Iowa sent more soldiers to the Union Army than any other state in the Union per capita. And the reason is, wisely, the Methodists understood two things. It wasn't their major doctrines, but they were not unashamed to speak of them. Number one, God has given us certain unalienable rights that we were endowed with by our Creator that are worth fighting for. And number two, and, and so part of that issue was the slavery. They did not believe in slavery, and they believed that 
all people being equal before God was important and they were willing to lay down their lives for it. And the second issue, which is a whole other sermon, but they believed that alcohol was the destroyer of not only your body, but of your marriage and your home. And they were unashamed to speak it. And they were willing to fight for the liberties and raise the banner of heart holiness to say you can live before God, sold out to the Lordship of Christ with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, love your neighbors, yourself. And you can live in holiness and righteousness, Luke 1, 73, 74, 75, 76, in there somewhere, all the days of your life. Not in the future, today. And we sit hundreds and thousands of soldiers to be in the Union Army. Say, Pastor Dave, why? Why are you belaboring all this? If you do it to fight against the Germans or to join the army, that's all history. Would you do it for your church? I don't purposely come to offend anybody on any Sunday, but I know the gospel is offensive in and of itself. And I read a a Facebook post from my friend today, a Nazarene pastor in the South, and he quoted John Wesley and said, John Wesley, here's his record. I preached here. They asked me not to come back. I preached here. They threw eggs at me. I preached here. They said, we don't ever want to see your face again. I preached here, and they threw tomatoes at me. And I'm not asking that you throw anything at me. But I'm saying for God's sake, for the sake of the church that Jesus died for. Would you be willing to take what God's given to you and put it on the altar and not worry about who the staff is or the pastor is or the change in the church? Would you be committed enough to Jesus Christ and his church to say, this is what God's gifted me with and I'm going to have it on the altar of full surrender and I'm not going to hold it back and I'm not going to pull back. I'm in 100% for the kingdom. It's not, as Rick Warren does, the core, the committed, the congregation, and the crowd, and the community. If you're not part of the committed and the core, we'll never reach the crowd and the community. And it starts not with the church next door or down the street. It starts with me. And it starts with you. And so this little green thing, would you pull it out? This little insert, I preach long, way too long. But we still have time to do what we're going to do today. Go to groups and support the lunch and the youth ministry. Here's the deal. Ephesians 4 says, God gives some to be prophets And some to be apostles, and some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers. And the pastors and teachers are supposed to equip the people for the work of the ministry. And so I'm asking you to take a moment, borrow an ink pen, borrow a pencil from somebody. Just lay it on the table when you leave the worship center. What general ministry area appeals to you? Pick a couple and check them. I like to serve up front, behind the scenes, in a group or alone. Check one. On the back side, I would like to work most with specific tasks, direct people, information, creative ideas, da-da-da. The people I like to work most with. And there's a whole list of categories. Here's my example. We wouldn't start... A second, a link, uh, 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 three classes a week for six months. We would not do that as a church for English as a second language if there was nobody in Cedar Rapids that needed to learn English. So here's the powerful truth God has right here in this room all the spiritual gifts that we need to do to do the ministry in Oakland Church, through Oakland Church in Cedar Rapids right now and in the next year or two. They're right here. We don't have to grow 50 or 100 people. What we need is people like you 
who will say, I'm, if I don't know my gift, I'm going to find my gift. I'm going to surrender it, and I'm willing to be involved rather than sitting on the sidelines. That's why we wore, won the Civil War. That's why we won World War II. That's why every church that's not in plateau or decline or shifting sheep is growing is if you go to those churches, they say, this is who I am. This is what God's called me to be, and this is where I serve. And I want to repeat, and I mean with all the love I can muster today. It is important who your pastor and staff are. But beyond them, they do not make up single-handedly the heart and the health and the unity and the vitality of your local church. You do. And that calls all of us to accountability and we'll say, somebody's going to say, well, you know, if I use my gift, I'll have to sacrifice. Yeah. If I use my gift, not everybody's going to like it. Yeah. If I use my gift, I'll probably push somebody else over. Probably not. Hello? Are we all right, church? Are we all right? I'm trying to preach the truth to you. It's hard truth, but it needs to be embraced. And this is a season. And remember, I'm partial when it comes to teams. If we fumble the football as a church, it's going to take a long time to recover. And if we are a winning church, and we're winning people, and the kingdom needle is advancing for the glory of God. It'll be because people like you say yes and plug in. Would you do it? You say, Pastor Dave, what are you going to do with these? Well, I'm going to sit down with two or three people, and we're going to compile them. And as long as I'm your interim pastor, I'm going to do, your, do my best as your spiritual shepherd to find a place of ministry that you feel comfortable in for the amount of time you have in this season of your life. And I'm going to leave them for the next pastor and the next staff so that when they come in, they say, well, who's in this church? And I say, well, here's a stack of 25 people who've been here a long time and aren't doing anything. They say they're willing, but they, they don't know where to plug in. And wouldn't it be great? I don't know when it's going to happen, whether it's a week or a month or two months or five months or six months. We... We say, we, our board said to our DS a week, at, two weeks ago today, we need some time as a church to heal. You know what part of the healing is? Getting in rather than sitting on the bleachers. You want your church to grow and be healthy, be healed? Get involved. Do it with all your heart, soul, mind, strength. Love him first and then use your gift to minister to people. Amen. Father, I praise you today. I thank you for Oakland Church of the Nazarene. And I pray that you would inspire us today to, to step up in this arena of availability to God with our spiritual gifts. Teach us what it means in the next few weeks and months, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. And before you go, going to journey groups. Now, there are a couple of them shifted, as you heard. Uh, stay for lunch or come back for lunch and pick up an envelope, but I, I want to say this, and I, I don't want to belabor it, but I'm touched by this, and I, I thought about it this morning. It's in my notes. I didn't say it. I want to say it before I leave. Blair's Ferry Road, you all heard Blair's Ferry Road? Hello? Yep. Some of you still aren't away. Well, you may not know this, but the charter, one of the charter couples of this church who were named Roy and Louise Blair and older than I am, 62 plus years ago, they left a church across town to come plant Oakland Nazarene. It happened to be my privilege 30 years ago when Roy Blair, who lived east of town on Blair's Ferry Road on the Blair Farm, came in from Mona's yard one day 
And he sat down in a chair in the kitchen and he took his cap off and he slumped over and went to heaven right there. And I had the privilege of laying him to rest and going through that season with the family. And I said to Roy and Louise's sons, would you take me to the back of the farm? Because back there on what was the edge of the Blair Farm was where the Cedar River came through. And Roy's descendants, the Blairs, one of the grandpa Blairs in the family, he had a ferry where they ferried people from one side of the river to the other. And I used that in Roy's funeral in this church. This man's descendants wanted people to get across the river safely to the other side. And they were so committed to that, that became the family legacy. Hence, Blair's Ferry Road. Now, Roy and Louise Blair were godly people, and some, a few of us in this room had the privilege of knowing them. But I want you to leave the service today and think about Oakland Church and its future. I'm telling you, the people who founded this congregation were all in, and they were deeply committed to getting people from one side of the spiritual river across the river of death with Jesus to the other side. If this church has a future, it'll be because today when you walk out of those doors in a minute or two, some of you will say, I'm going to be that kind of committed Christian even with my spiritual gifts. God bless you. Go be the church. This joy is mine.